Hello everybody and welcome back to the Biff Rugby League podcast. It's episode 7. We're back to a full complement of, of hosts this week. Robin is back. Um, he might be off next week. We don't know. He hasn't told us yet. Um, yeah. But it's good to see him. Before we get into everything, how was your trip back home, Toby? How was your, how's your last week been to, uh, as well, Robin? Yeah, I, I visited... Uh visited Wales but sadly North Wales Crusaders decided to play in blooming the Wirral so uh, great win for them um, bit, quite happy with it they actually look like a strong team this season so you might find me uh, back in the, the inside the Welsh border more often this uh, <laughs> this year if they're going to keep playing the way they seem to be playing the Challenge Cup but yeah good week good I'm glad right Robin what about yourself you had a you didn't stay yeah, in York I, did you no I actually was in Wales this week as well visiting my granddad so <laughs> That was nice to see him after quite a long time, um, but yeah, happy to be happy to be back speaking to you again. Good, it is good for you to be back, and we've lumped quite a lot on you this week. You've had to come in with a, a story of the round. It's your turn for Hall of Fame. You've just had six out of six on on predictions, which I was pretty chuffed with my five, five out of five. You you are on a roll at the minute, and so we've we've given you the punishment of having to to play catch up and, and do loads of others. I'm still at the back though, still trying to catch you for. Yeah, it's not that far. I mean, I'm I'm ahead, so I don't mind that. It's the first time I've led since we started doing it last year, so it, it's it's I'm I'm glad we are we are where we are. There's been obviously today we're discussing it's Pancake Day, Happy St David's Day. Get those two out of the way. They're not the important bits of news that came out today. Yeah, look at him. He's well chuffed in the back there with his with his Welsh flag. Happy St David's Day, Toby. Um, but that's not important. We had the England squad out today, as well. So it was interesting to see lots of people go not not particularly happy with with the team that was picked. Before we get into the story of the round, we, we may as well just mention it. We we put it in the chat, and both of you went, "We're not winning a World Cup with that team." Do we really think that if we add the NRL talent, we we could get to a World Cup final? I don't think so. I think when you when you look at those players. Um, there's no, there's no real standout. There's nothing that gets me really excited. There's, there's a couple of players that um, can almost hold their own in an NRL match, for example, George Williams, but uh, or maybe yeah, John, John Bateman, you could argue as well. But I mean, that was even, even that was a few years ago. Now I don't think he's the player he was when he was over there. So when you think that that's an NRL game and that's against obviously some real top strong sides. Mm. But then you want to play the best of the best of them in Australia and New Zealand, and even Tonga have got a really strong side. I just don't, I just don't feel too hopeful about our chances. I think I'm, uh, I might have to shift my allegiance and uh, <laughs> back Wales at least, <laughs> something like that. You're gonna... maybe Jamaica or just go for a different team because I can't stand and watch this England side just get completely thrashed. No, it won't be, won't be very nice to see see us get beat. Toby, as our sort of resident NRL expert, is there any player in the NRL that England will make, might look at that they might not have looked at before, particularly those that haven't had a call up yet? Uh, that's an interesting uh, question. That actually, um, uh, in terms of not had a call up before, uh, I'm not particularly convinced. We'll see sort of how Herbie Farnworth does. Um, I mean, he might have had sort of a training squad call. Up yeah, he has. But... Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, there's like un- uncapped. We'll go. We'll say uncapped. Then, is there any uncapped players in in the NRL that you yeah, think might be able to make an impact? Yeah, in terms of, we'll see what sort of season he has. But the thing I don't like about this England squad is I genuinely don't think from sort of one to five the, the options are good enough, mm. or at least experienced enough, or proven it at, at a test level that they can do, that they can play internationally. Uh, I've got I've got other concerns, but that's the one where you really need a standout winger or centre going into this uh, World Cup. Eng- England, I'm I'm not an England fan, but England really need a <laughs> standout uh, sort of centre or winger, and I'm not sure that any of these players really excite me. Um, sort of to, about that. And again, there's potential that Harry Newman becomes that kind of player. Mm. Um, pretend, obviously Jack Wellsby if he's going to slot in in the centres or wings, that's really exciting. But, I mean, I think based on this squad, I'd have him at full-back. Um, so, there is some... I think Herbie Farmworth is the one for me where... Or, or sort of any sort of centre or winger. Um, 
other than that, I think Ryan Sutton and Luke Thompson will be nailed on to be part of the England team come World Cup time. Um, and Oliver Gildart as well, um, and who could be the other centre option. And that's quite interesting because right now I look at this and I've sort of got Hardacre and Percival as my centres. Okay. Uh, I don't know obviously what, what direction you two are going. But then when I think now that that could be Gildart and Farnworth, if Farnworth has a good season, Gildart has a good mm. season, that's all of a sudden starting to scream World Cup finalists at a minimum. So I don't know how you two feel about that. Yeah, I mean, just just going off the, the England squad that has been picked, you, and Tompkins being given the captain's armband, I kind of feel like you have to put him at fullback because that's his most natural position. He's the captain of the team. You're going to need him in a position where he he thrives, and because he's at fullback, and you need Jack Wellsby in your seventeen, Jack Wellsby either starts at centre or he drops to the bench as, as your utility, and because he can play anywhere in the back seven, very very comfortably. And if you get an injury, then then that's where he goes from there. In terms of your centres, you're probably looking at Harry Newman uh, in there as well. And then, like you said, Hardacre is probably going to have to shift into there. And I think the wings sort of speak to themselves. You're looking at Tom, Tommy Makinson and Tom Davies, aren't you? I think just off this one, there's not really many others. You must surprised that Ryan Hall and Jermaine McGilvray have been selected again ahead of the likes of Tom Johnston. Um, big big names have missed out. No Gareth Widdup, no Tom Johnston, no Jake Connor. Uh, uh, is that a surprise for you, Robin? Yeah, Jake Connor's the big one for me. I think... Um... Like he he has got some mistakes in his game, discipline issues, um, but in a way I think we're not the favourites. If we if we play the standard game, we'll get beat every time. We kind of need someone who's going to be a bit different, maybe get under the skin of, of these other teams. So for me, Jake Connor should have definitely been included over some of these names, and uh, and I think he like he can sort of help out with that centre issue that you're talking about. Mm. Um, with Widder, um I mean, we know he's we know he can be great, but um, like we haven't we haven't seen it in him recently. Maybe I don't know. Again, why wouldn't you just have him in the squad? Why wouldn't you have him there? Another another player um, that I'd want to see in there. Obviously, he's a young guy, but he he came onto the scene and smashed it last year, and that's uh, Mikey Lewis. I don't mm. I don't think it would do any harm having him in and around the team, building for the World Cup, even if this isn't his year. In five years' time, we'd have a, a Mikey Lewis that's experienced at the international level, and that's quite exciting for us. Yeah, hundred percent. You're looking at the inexperienced players in this squad. Lewis Dodds in there for the first time, and you've got Kai Pierce Paul in there. The others you could look at. You look at Harry Newman, but we know he's got these quality. He's done it. He's done it, and he can do it. Mikhail Aledsky, he's young, he's but he's very experienced in terms of his, his Super League level, and we know the, the quality he can do. Is there a little bit of pressure on Pierce, Paul and Dodd now that they've been named in this squad or I mean Lewis Dodd for me has definitely deserved it he's been unreal this year and he was really good towards the end of last year when he played but Kai Pierce, Paul is it maybe a little bit too early for him? If I was selecting a, an all-star team and not an England team Lewis Dodd would actually probably start in the halves for me in terms of how their form that they've got going mm. in you know from Super League yeah. obviously international rugby is a different sort of sort of thing and I think Lewis Dodd will just thrive from here he seems to have met pressure head on um, the whole time he's been fantastic Kai Pierce Paul was the name he was the one name which when I read through the list where I went that's the one I didn't expect to see at yeah. all um, yeah so I'm impressed that he's in the squad um, we'll see sort of how he goes from here um, but it's um yeah, it, 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 this that's the one name which I think is like the bolter of the squad almost. Yeah, yeah, I get you. It's very much, very much surprised to see him in there. But I feel like now that he has been named, it's going to take a lot for someone like Sean Wayne, who he's probably got a little bit of Wigan bias. He say he won't, but I, th I feel like it's always going to be there for him. If if someone's playing well for Wigan, they're going to get over. They're going to. So they're going to be picked over someone who's potentially playing well for, say, Warrington, even if that player's play, like, arguably playing a little bit better. And I think that's why you've got the likes of Kai Pierce Paul in there. And where's the other name that I'm missing? Where's it gone? There was more. There was more Wigan players in there that I saw. I'm sure there was. Liam Farrell. Thing is, Liam Farrell was in there, but I think he starts. I think he's the, like you look at that squad, and he is the second rower. Like in that squad, he's the, he's the first name that pops onto that sheet. Like I think the 
the, the pack picks itself in terms of Wormsley, Lees, Farrell, Bateman, Knowles. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that that just on that thirty man squad that he's picked, that's your team. And then you're looking at you bring Ryan Sutton in, you bring Whitehead over. You've got the Burgess brothers over there. Probably Tom over George. We we saw how bad George was um, when he came over for Wigan, but they're both now at separate clubs in the NRL. You've got, like I said, Ryan Sutton. These players have got to pick. The Super League players have got to go out there and say, "I'm the best prop in the world," or "I'm the best second row in the world," and play better than the blokes that are over in the NRL. 100%. I think, I think that this squad in general, Wayne knows who his forwards are going to be in, in the World Cup. Yeah. Because it's the backs in the halves that he's really trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a little bit... It's an interesting squad, actually, the more I look at it. Um, but it is. I feel like there's, this is too much confusion when you consider this is the position he should have been in, like... A year like 2020, yeah. And now it's the World Cup's got delayed by a year, and still seems to be in a position he should have been in a while ago. Yeah, is, do you think there'll be a shock name potentially in the squad? Are you and and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a name out there now of a player that was born in England but has never played in England and is a halfback, Sam Walker. He's never gonna play for Australia, is he? Is he, is he is he going to play for Australia? No, he's not, is he? But but I don't know. It, it, I don't think I don't think in my experience he's not shown any interest in 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 England. So I don't I don't see that happening to be honest. But it would be pretty cool because yeah, I do rate him. He's, he's done well and he's at he's at one of the top clubs in the NRL. So he's only going to get better from here in theory. Yeah, Toby. Is it something that I know you're not a, a, an England fan? Is it something that if if you were an England fan, you'd want to try and sort of see Sean Wayne do, if that makes sense. If if you wanted to see a halfback come into the team, it's going to be someone like Sam Walker, isn't it? I mean, look what happened when uh, Great Britain decided to start converting people's nationalities um, in terms of the public criticism of that and how awful they played um, on the tour down under. But I do genuinely think that there isn't a good enough half partner for George Williams. In this squad, um, I don't, and I don't. I'm not convinced there's sort of Jackson Hastings would be the answer either if he decided to sort of pledge allegiance to England. Mm. These uh, guys, the World Cup. And, and that's the thing. Jackson Hastings has pledged his allegiance to Great Britain, but it means he has to now play for one of the British nations. He can't go out there and now play for Australia. At, in with the very slim odds of that ever happening, he'd ha- he'd have to now go and play for England or any other nation that he's eligible for. But I don't think he's eligible for any others. So. The players like Gildart and well Hastings and Blake Austin that have played for Great Britain but not for England are now going to have to stake a huge claim for that to happen. Obviously, playing under for Great Britain under Wayne Bennett, it, it was which is a totally different style of rugby. But we must we must move on. We must move on. We get we get a bit carried away. We we will discuss it when we have our international rounds later in the year and see how that squad compares to to this squad. It is his only. It is his first training squad of the year. This is his. This is his best 30 players that he can select, that he feels he can select at this point. So good luck to Sean Wayne and fingers crossed, especially for me and Robin's sake and every other England fan, that it, it is good enough by the time the World Cup rolls around. But Robin, we need, we need a story of the round or a story of the week this week. Yes. Um, what what, this, have, what have you got story, for us? It's just an, a, an interesting uh, comparison between two teams that um, we spoke about in the start of the pre-season. One's doing way better than we predicted, and one's doing way worse. So, I start. I start with the worst team, Leeds. Obviously, <laughs> um, we gave them quite good raps this year. I, I thought bringing in um, Austin and Caesar together with Myla in the squad, the, the, the you know Harry Newman, Oledski, they've got players that are international standard. Uh, and they narrowly missed out to, to Warrington in round one in that ch- uh, Channel 4 game. Um, they lost to Wigan. They weren't very exciting there. They lost to Catalans. And um, they're currently sat without a win in three rounds. Um, and, and to be honest, we're all we're all saying it. We're all thinking it. We're all looking at Rich Vega. And, you know, he must be getting nervous. They must be thinking, you know, <laughs> this time's coming. We can't find a win. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens this week. They've, they've got Wakefield that we, we predicted to 
from bottom. So this is is now a um, a relegation battle between those two teams in round four. <laughs> it's about um, it's a four pointer, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. It really is. So um, yeah, a, a team that we thought were going to do well at Dunbar, and on the flip side in the championship, uh, a team that we predicted down at the bottom of the table. I think we, we put them in 13th, didn't we? Um, yeah. That was Barrow. Obviously, they came up from uh, League One last year. Uh, they, spent, they spent three years down there. Uh, and they've come, they've come in this season, and um, they're currently fourth. But that's just based on the, um, on the points difference, because they are, they are actually undefeated so far this year. They've had three wins. Um, and they've also got to the to the next round of the Challenge Cup. So now they're the um, longest lasting, lowest ranked team, if that makes sense, in the Challenge Cup. Um, and yeah, it's a it's an in- interesting um, an interesting thing that's happened. I don't know if it'll last, but it's good for them to get a good start. Um, and. Just if anybody out there was thinking of giving them uh, the underdog status and, and feel like backing them, I just wanted to just add an, another tone of nuance to the to the Barrow story and the uh, the controversy last year with where they had uh, they've they've been accused, it's not proven, that they were faking COVID tests to avoid um, to avoid the match against the other promotion favourites, um, Workington, and so you know they're not they're not just the good guys. They are, they, you know, if you want a reason to hate them, not just because they're doing better than your team, there's a reason. Um, but yeah, they've got they've got a decent squad, haven't they? We like the look of uh, Maloudi and um, Samet, so let, let's see what's going to happen. This stage in the season, they're making us look silly because our predictions are wrong, but, um, you know, it's interesting. Let's, let's see what happens. Yeah, after three or four rounds of both leagues, our predictions aren't amazingly great. Um, Barrow certainly leads the other like you said one for a good reason or one for a bad reason um, Barrow have lost a player today I believe in, in Jordan Wallen both him and his, his brother Adam have retired due to concussion related injuries and it's something that we discussed right at the beginning of this series of, of podcasts they need to replace someone like Jordan Wallen because he's got that Super League he's got that little bit of Super League experience from when I believe he was at Wakefield um, he's got plenty of championship experience from when he was is there as well do you think the likes of T. Ritson, Jad, Jared Samet, um, Hakeem Aludi, if Barrow, do you think they stay at Barrow this year or do you think they'll end up playing for a higher up club? Because when a player does it in League One, it's always like, oh, let's look out for him. He might be he might be all right. But then when they, do, when they come in and they do it in the Championship, it's a totally different story. We know Maludi can do it in the Super League. We know Samet can do it at the top level of the Championship. Do you think it's T. Ritson's turn to, start to say, oh, look, I can do it too. I'm going to be the first Super League Thai player. Like, I'm going to be a Thailand international, first ever Thailand international in the Super League. Like, do you think, do you, do you see that happening? Like, you, you know a lot, you probably know a bit more about Barrow from like, last year from Toby when, when North Wales played them. And T. Ritson's a quality player, isn't he? Yeah, he very much is. I think he had an off day against, uh, against Crusaders when Barrow travelled. So. No, I, I, it's uh, what's incredible about this squad is that they're growing as a team. Um, they've gone into the uh, the championship as a team who uh, who were very very dominant in League One, and then had a wobble. Started to show that look, we know maybe our fitness isn't completely there. Maybe we're we're not as good as people are making out. And they've gone into the championship and they've gone. That's not the case. We have got quality. So they what they've done as well is they've given Maludi, who really struggled to sort of for, you know find. A place comfortable for him in the world of rugby. They've they've made a home for him. Um, you know they've managed to convince Jared Samet to join. Things like this. They seem to have something really good going on. Um, they, as I said, they're growing as a team. They're getting better as a team. Um, and yeah, it, it, I mean, I, let's see sort of how they go. They're a good. They're a Cumbrian representative. If we can get a Cumbrian representative to be a a big name in rugby league that's fantastic so yeah i mean all the best to them um but it's um i don't think sort of i'll start with your question i think they will all stay together this year yeah it could be a squad that's very quickly taken apart um <laughs> but you know there is players there absolutely showing that they belong in promotion battles at the moment yeah 100 percent. and 
speaking about, you said they're undefeated in the league, but they're also undefeated in the cup as well. Like they, they, they did really well in the Challenge Cup this weekend. They've got Workington at home in the next round. They they face they face Workington again, and they, there was this thing last year, like you said, to, Robin, of them not really wanting to face Workington towards the end of last season against one of their promotion rivals. They haven't got a choice this time. In two, in two weeks' time, they'll face them in in the fifth round, and they might they'll they'll most likely have a Super League opposition to face in in round six. If because Workington sat bottom of the league, four losses out of four. Barrow, th- I think, three wins from three and a cup win. There's there's pressure on them, isn't there, to to def- to beat Workington and, and continue that streak in in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, there definitely is. The two two uh, Cumbrian rivals. If Workington will, will want to do one over on them, but at the same time, looking at that Workington team season, they're going to be focusing on the league more than the cup. They know that yeah, it would be sweet to beat Barrow in the cup. But at the same time, they're not going to progress further than there, and it would be much more valuable to them to beat them in the in the league. So, in a way, I I don't think that it's going to have the same intensity that it could do in in other seasons. Um, but the the pressure is still definitely there, like you say, the back story between the two. Like the fans will the fans will want it, the fans will care and be interested. So there there is there is pressure, but. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I like this Barrow team. I like um, what they've done. I like that they're, they're climbing through mm. the leagues together. And, um, yeah, I, I'd like to see them um, carry on for the rest of the year, despite the fact that it's doing our predictions dirty. But then, <laughs> it, you know, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be entertaining, would it, if we knew what was going to happen? No, exactly. If we knew exactly where all these teams were going to finish, it would, be, it would be boring, like you said. We did say about Barrow, though, it, it did depend on the likes of Hakeem Maloudi and Jared Samet and... T. Rickson to see how they could perform against top level um, championship sides, and they seem to be doing a fantastic job. And for all you Barrow fans out there, we do hope that they carry that on. It, it wasn't just Barrow that played this weekend in the Challenge Cup, though. We had um, we had twelve other ties, I believe, or um, how many teams we've got? Ten. So we had, I think, we had twelve ties or ten games this weekend, and North Wales Crusaders come out thirty points to eight against Hunslet. Uh, the Royal Navy's run came to a crashing end at uh, um, Batley Bulldogs. They, they went down 66-6. Doncaster got absolutely annihilated 60-0 at home against Whitehaven. Hunslet Club Parkside, only four points down at half-time at home against the Sheffield Eagles, eventually losing 20 points uh, to 40. Workington 26-12 against Drewsbury. Featherstone at the Shea beating Halifax 29-16. Bradford 34, London 8 in uh, at Wimbledon. We said we've already said Rochdale lost to Barrow 12 38. Um, Robin, your Knights at, uh, did the number over Newcastle 42 13, and then Lee Centurions beating Witness 38 4 last night as well. So how how do you is there any is there any fixture there that stands out for you or any result? I think it's a very impressive result for a Hunslet Club Parkside to put 20 on Sheffield. Um, you know, at a minimum, it makes me quite excited for North Wales Crusaders to play them in the next round um, because Sheffield are showing that they're a team we like to concede. Um, and other than that, it's sort of it was championship teams winning, it was favourites winning for the most part. Um, Making me really nervous about my uh, Newcastle Thunder to finish high up in the championship <laughs> prediction. Um, so thanks for that, Robin. Um, yeah. Other than that, it's sort of it's the it was the weekend where we just iron out the cup and we say right, only good teams left now. Yeah, and is that is that a problem? Do you think that's the fact that there is only good teams left it is an issue? Uh, no, I think the, the the truth is that the gap between the leagues is massive, and the every, every time we we introduce these these higher ranked sides, it is just clearing out the the ones that are left, and it's 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 naturally going to happen. The only way that a team can really progress in the cup is if they get quite lucky with draws, and they all play each other rather than joining. Whereas this was a pretty predictable round. Um, obviously, there's some scores like Toby said the Sheffield game that's a that's a bit of a shock to see how many they let in um, I don't think that York were expecting to score as many as they did um, and 
yeah, but I think it's I think it's you know expected. Let's be honest, it, it's not it wasn't a, a round of um, unpredictability. Let's put it that way. No, is is that a bad thing for the cup though? That in terms of we we do we mention this unless unless you um, unless you made the fixtures unless you fixed them so that it, it created drama every now and again you're going to get a round that's readable that's just you have to have them because then it then it wouldn't be special when you did get an upset you know what I mean so yeah. I think it's I think it's fine I think we still got to see some really good games and some 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 really nice tries scored it's uh, it's just one of those things in my opinion. It is unavoidable, and I, I would just add the Workington and Keaton do, so that's a big result for Workington going forward. Mm. Um, but it is unavoidable, but I think what annoys me about it is the fact that why weren't the Navy, you know, the Navy have done such a great job to get to this point. Why couldn't they have had the chance to go to Leeds or Huddersfield or, or, or you know, another Super League club? Why, did, you know, why were they limited to, to just being able to play the Championship clubs? It's kind of like just... The, you know, the that, well, that's thing. still a massive reach for them to play a championship club. It's still huge. The only yeah. way that it could have been made possible is if they drew Hunslet. But you're talking one out of another, what was it, 24 teams? It's just that's that's the magic of the cup yeah. is that it's well, yeah. a really small yeah. chance. It's, it's the fact that we've potentially, we'll, like, we'll have no League One teams to play in Super League sides. So that, that's another thing, right? You, you've got North Wales Crusaders, the, the lowest ranked team left in the competition. They've got a tie at home against a Sheffield side that looks like looks like they could potentially be beaten, especially by a high flying League One team. We we might only get one League One team against Super League teams, but Super League teams are only three games away from Wembley. Like, yeah, I, I, could could yeah. you could you see the Super League teams maybe coming in earlier, or maybe the bottom four Super League teams maybe coming in around earlier, just to give sides that chance of okay we might get a super league team in round 4 or round 5 before the top the, before the real big dogs come in yeah i mean that's the thing is it like the navy have given us such a like fantastic storyline through the cup for so many weeks but they're out before the big boys turn up and i see mm. what I, I see what you're saying but i just think i just think it's unavoidable the the, the difference in the the standard it, you can't get away from it they they if the navy played a super league side you know, it's a, it's a bit of fun. It's an achievement to get there, but you know what the result's going to be. So it would almost be a more competitive game to see Batley play a Super League side and therefore more attractive to a, a neutral that might be watching the game. Yeah, the, I think the thing that, that's sticking out in me is potentially the a financial implication for the League One and maybe the you're looking at the Southern Conference League or the National Conference League sides that might charge a little bit of money for a fixture, even if it's two pound for a program. If you get a thousand people at Distington against, I don't know, even well, Distington against Lee Centurions, for example, would, uh, and I say that as a as a top level Championship side or well, let's let's go with Toulouse. Like Toulouse are a lower level Super League side. We know that they're going to be a bottom four side. Imagine they played someone like Distington. Toulouse might not go out there and, and pick. Their best team, they might go and put. They might bring their their French reserve team over, but they're still playing to lose. Uh, is people will still come and watch that? They'll make a bit of money, and even if it was just rock run round earlier, you're still going to get six, uh, four, or well, you're still going to get eight Super League teams potentially in the qu- quarter final, or or if you have all those teams earlier, they've got a chance of being drawn against each other, and then you've got more chance of a Championship or League One side making the quarter finals and the, and the semi finals. Yeah. So question, would you rather be slapped about on the Batley ski slope, or, uh, <laughs> or inside like uh, Headingley? In, I'd <laughs> I'd rather be I'd rather be beat sixty six six by Leeds than Batley. Yeah. And to have the chance yeah, to do I that. Just think, I think I, I I love the Challenge Cup and I love how it links links like the top to the bottom of the competition. But but when I see those sixty six six score lines, it does make me wince a bit. And I just think it's the achievement was the round before. Do you know what I mean? The Royal Navy won their Challenge Cup when they got to play Batley. It didn't matter about the game. And for me, that's it's an uncomfortable position to be in. Like, we, we, we want people... We're not a sport blessed with lots of fans. We want people who go and watch a game to enjoy a, a close, competitive match. That's going to be the most enjoyable game to watch. So, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying, and it's not fair, but it, sport isn't fair. Like, you can't... You can't create a fake situation where these these teams get to play each other just 
because then they can say, oh, we played late, because who who's going to... Nobody nobody really wins once that game is played. They only win once they get to the game. So, so they might... <laughs> I, I don't know. The Royal Navy have given us a, a great challenge cup. So have put, um, Brunswick Club Parkside. But this is the level now where they leave. This is this is what they're working towards. They weren't mm. ever going to beat these sides, and that's just something that it's we've just got to iron it out and and now move on to the to the biggest teams that draw in the biggest crowds and hopefully pull in new new fans through these competitive high stakes games. Do you think we should make it potentially harder for the Super League teams instead, though, or give them a few more games to get to Wembley? I'd love it to be harder for them. I'd love it. I, it's embarrassing that they only play three games and they're in the final. But how, how, who else do they play? We aren't blessed with loads of really strong sides. No, but if you put them in, a, if you put them in a round earlier, if you put them in a round earlier, instead of I them just playing think themselves, more scores. yeah, I think, yeah. So it, it's re- it's difficult. My my opinion is I'd like to see. I'm not so bothered about who plays who. As I would rather see competitive matches, but there's no there's no way you can have a cup that takes everyone and narrows it down to the top without ha- without having some match matchups that are, that aren't close. So no. let's just get them out of the way. Let's get them out of the way. Let's get these commu- yeah. let's get these tight tight quality potentially upsetting affairs out of the way, and then let's get the big boys play. And I suppose that's why they brought in. Because they've, they've brought so much to the cup, and that's what the cup's all about. But it, but we've just got a, the step between the the like community level and the league one is not as big. And every time we add another league, the step gets bigger and bigger. There's, it's just got to happen if we want it to unite all the way through. Yeah, 100%. I get you. We do need to move on, though. We need to pick our player of the round. And... I can't really go to anyone else other than Toby for this. Um, would you like to take it away, Mr. Jones? So, the year is 2019. <laughs> and North Wales Crusaders have just been scouring the uh, the amateur players in the north of the country. England, that is, not Wales. <laughs> yeah, north, no, there is. But um, they've been scouring and they've found the captain of Haydock. Jordan Gibson. He goes by the name Geordie. He signs for North Wales Crusaders on a certain professional contract. And uh, at that point, he was an England Lions international. He has been outstanding for Crusaders. And this weekend, he scores a hat trick in to make Crusaders the only League One team left in the Challenge Cup. Um, he's been an incredible halfback um, for since he signed and it was on display how good he was um, this weekend oh how good he is this weekend uh, he's just got a real eye for sort of finding gaps um, and yeah I think he'll definitely be uh, in the championship next year um, so yeah he's a player of the round for his hat trick um, against Hunslet in the Challenge Cup is Geordie Gibson Quick question on Geordie Gibson is he going to be a championship player with North Wales Crusaders next year or is he going to be a championship player for say Whitehaven or well not Workington because they'll probably get relegated but Sheffield or some or someone like that. I've seen North Wales Crusaders bottle pretty much everything <laughs> on the thirteen season. If you go back to one of the, uh, the podcasts and hear about that. Um but yeah, so I, I wouldn't I haven't got my hopes up, but the way they're playing the Challenge Cup I would say that they, they should be favourites to win League One based based on their Challenge Cup performances. That's that is perfectly. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to see you. You want your Crusaders in, in League One and to win League One, and you expect Jordy Gibson to be in the championship and fully deserved Player of the Round. Like you said, a, ha- a hat trick against Hunslet, fellow League One side, pushes you into a tie with Sheffield Eagles that you could potentially win. They look like a beatable team, and they're very inconsistent. We know that, uh, and a potential Super League team in in round six. Um, in North Wales, potentially. Uh, he'll join Jai Field, Liam Johnson and Cameron Smith as our player of the rounds for the, for the for the last month. And they will go into our, our team of the month for February, which I know it's the 1st of March, but it will be out. It should be out now before this podcast goes live. So if you haven't seen it already, check out the social media. You can see our team of the month. Um, I know for a fact that Jai Field's at fullback, Geordie Gibson's in seven, Liam Johnson's in 12, Cameron Smith, I think, is in 13, and then Jake Connor, we've uh, we've given the number six shirt to because you don't get six assists and a try in one weekend, and and top the I believe he's top of the Man of Steel charts as well. So 
You don't you don't do that if, and not get in our team of the month. But we do need to talk about Super League. We'll discuss the table first before we go anywhere. Before we look at the last round of fixtures, Saints are top, three wins from three, followed by Wigan, then swiftly followed by Warrington. Huddersfield in fourth, not, they're not doing too badly at all. Hull FC, Salford and Catalan join them with two wins out of three. Hull Kingston Rovers are the only team with just one win. But Wakefield, Leeds, Castleford Tigers and Toulouse are pointless after after three rounds. We expected at least two of those teams to have had a win by now, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's... Um... Yeah, well, I mean, Robin sort of mentioned um, how disappointed we are with Leeds' season so far. Um, Castleford, I think this was always a possibility for Castleford, but I didn't think Radford was going to be awful. Um, I did. I, I thought Castleford were going to sort of pull everything together. Um, with regards to Leeds, I will sort of just remind, like last season, they won two of their first seven games and they were both against Wakefield. So if they don't beat Wakefield this weekend, then things really are... Um, mm. are are tragic for them. I think, yeah, but for Toulouse and Wakefield to both not have a win yet, I think is completely sort of fair enough. Um, surprised by Castleford just because I thought that there was a bit of spirit there, which there doesn't seem to be. Um, but and yeah, as I say with Leeds, they've been unlucky with injuries, but also uh, Richard Agar just hates the start of seasons. <laughs> we meant, Robin, you mentioned, you mentioned that Richard Agar's probably sweating a little bit if he doesn't get a win I I know he's been inconsistent we we looked at the loss against Bradford he took last year or not last year in 2019 in, in the in the cup and I looked at it then and went I don't know if Richard Agar's the man for this job since then Kevin Sinfield's left he hasn't got a proper right hand man uh, people like Chris Chester have lost their job at Wakefield and Willie Poaching's come in and not much has changed there is, is it time for Leeds to maybe not change their identity because I think their team is ready I just think maybe they need a different style of play. Is that right? Yeah, I would agree with that analysis. I think I think it's, it's a strong Leeds team, and that's why we gave them um, such high hopes for the season. Um, I think we've all known for a long time that Richard Agar's got this in him. You know, has has he is he capable of converting this strong side into a winning side and a consistent side? And yeah, I think. Um, I mean, you said last night you you put forward Sinfield, and um, I don't know if I don't know if that'll happen. I don't know. Sinfield so is a busy man, isn't he? And um, I mean, it didn't he appoint Agar? So mm. you know, I don't know where they look. I don't I don't know what they do, but it it feels to me that the missing piece for this lead side is is definitely the coach. Yeah, Toby, do you think are you, are you sort of in the same boat as that? Do you think? Someone like Kevin Sinfield appointing Agar and then sort of leaving him to run the club from from the top it is is was was rough, <laughs> or do you think that someone like Kevin Sinfield maybe needs to come in? He's doing a really good job at Leicester as a defence coach, but we know that rugby league players make great rugby union defence coaches. It doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily going to make him a fantastic rugby league coach, is it? No, um, I, I think sort of wipe your hands with Kevin Sinfield if you lead. In the nicest possible way. Obviously, you still want him there for the memorial, but I mean, in terms of, you know, it seems to be their answer to everything. Uh, it's you know, since since like great players retired, it's been like, oh, we'll just get Jamie Peacock, Danny Maguire, and uh, Kevin Sinfield to to coach them. Oh, we'll just get them to mm. to play a memorial game. Oh, we'll just get them to. Uh, yeah, it's um, it, yeah, I think it is that like a, a new direction completely. Uh, I I know Agar's going to pull off some impressive wins this season. There is going to come a point, you know, where, uh, you know, this season where he's going to beat like Saints or something. We're all going to go, oh, now watch out for Leeds. They might be fifth, but they could come through the playoffs and they won't. Um, I think there is that. There's a real lack of consistency with Agar ever since he sort of took took reins of the Leeds job. Um, he's just been very inconsistent. Um, and but and I don't know what the answer is. You know, they just before him they tried Dave Ferner, didn't they? And, that really didn't work out, so they're, they're probably a bit hesitant to go through the Aussie route. What English coaches are available? Probably Chris Chester. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, I think it's just a tricky situation because there's a real lack of quality coaches, sort of in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, they they're really struggling, and I th- like I said, I think I'm with you there, Robin. I think 
the, the inconsistent you see that Agar brings is, is tough for them and it, it will make them struggle. Do you think the likes of Matt Pete are sat there licking their lips, like rubbing their hands going, I've got to lose next. I can really show like my fans what this team is really about. They've got Catalan in two weeks' time. Like they they've got they've got well they've got they've got a f- two they've got two away trips in a row to France. Like they're going to stay over there, aren't they? They then they're not going to fly home to fly back to France, are they? Who, who knows? I don't. I think um, like teams used to do the whole like staying overnight thing and, and found that it was better to just do it in and out. So I don't. I doubt they'll stay the week. To be perfectly honest, but yeah, it'd be a nice holiday, wouldn't it? Did. <laughs> I'm sure that'd be a good team building, but yeah, I think um, like like Toby said, there, there is a real lack of coaches out there, and it, it sort of leads her in a really awkward situation where that that's the missing piece, and there's nothing out there, or it seems to us there's nothing out there. Um, but then you know, look at Wigan; they they're willing to take a chance on a, an unknown coach, um, and and he's coming up with the results. So maybe they maybe they need to look for a, a name that nobody's ever heard of. Maybe they need to try that out. Yeah, maybe another team that I win before we move on is is Cass. They, Lee Rafford goes up against his old side Hull FC. Does he get the two points this week, or do you think Hull FC will will run right? The likes of Jake Connor, we just we just dead. he's he's just too good, isn't he? At the minute, he's he's having a fantastic year. Yeah, he was on fire last week, wasn't he? So if he carries that form across, then um, I, I'll back Hull FC. I mean, they've been without. Um, uh, Luke Gale as well, um, mm. so and that hasn't really seemed to slow him down either. Although you know playing against Wakefield's a different thing. I will say about Cass, I think um, whilst it does look bad where they are on the table, um, I still think you know they they played Hull KR in the first round. We did we do we did expect that Hull KR would finish above them in the table. We expected that Warrington would finish above them in the table. They lost to Warrington, and also that you know that was probably. Um, on Daryl Powell's list of game, like must-win games, so mm. that's that would have been a tough side. The shock is that they lost to Salford. That that's a bit inexplainable, but I I still hold a little bit of hope in there that they can redeem the season. Um, and maybe maybe this game against Hull FC is a good place to start. Yeah, we quickly briefly mentioned to lose last night, and and Toby, you said if Oli Ashall box stays fit and he's playing at fullback, and they have a they have a bit of a core there now, they they're going to win a game or two. It's going to be a long way off, though, isn't it? Yeah, they've probably got a lot of sort of um, working together that they need to do um, over the next, um, you know, over the next sort of few weeks to be able to build up to a point where they are sort of one functional unit. Um, I think that that sort of no Mark Carella playing, no Jonathan Ford playing, is really like affecting them um, and sort of their dynamic, but. It's. Um, I think with you know Oli Ashwabot is a, from what we've seen at his best, he could be a sufficient replacement for one of those players. And they probably need to work on getting another player to sort of replace Jonathan Ford. But again, it's um, it's like they know where their issues are and they are trying to work to fix them. And I think they will pick up three or four wins um, as we go on the season. But they're not going to do anything close to what London managed to do. But I mean, they need to do it soon, don't they? Because they've got Wakefield is the, is the game after the, the next game, so. Like they actually really do need to kick into gear because if they don't, then they're gonna be like that is a, a four point game. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you said, they've got they've got Wigan at home this week, then they've got Wakefield away, followed by where is it? They've got Saints the week after that. So we know for a fact that if they're gonna pick up a win in the next three games, it has to be against Wakefield, because oh, and then if they're gonna win the games after that, they've got Cass. Like they need to win at least. They need to beat Wakefield. They need to beat Cass to give themselves that foothold in the league. A one win out of those four games probably isn't enough for them. But that we they're definitely not going to get more than two. They've got the high flying Wigan Warriors and the high flying St Helens. You mentioned Barrow doing better than expected this year. Are Wigan doing a lot better than expected this year, Robin? Or do you think we do you think we maybe underestimated them? Not? Yeah, I do it every year. I underestimate. Wigan every single year, and they all they always come strong. So I'm not I'm not surprised, but yeah, they 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 are doing better than than expected. Salford City Red. Oh, so, sorry, Salford Red Devils. Two years ago, maybe three seasons ago, now 
grand finalists. I believe it was maybe two seasons. I might be, I might be wrong. Catalan Dragons last season, grand finalists. Sixth and seventh, two wins out of three. Salford are looking at their points difference is only four, the same as Hull FC's. Hull Kingston Rovers, semi finalists last year, playoff semi finalists. They're only on one win out of two. These four sides have got, well, those three sides have got a lot to work on, but you can see that the wins are just about there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I think. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. I'd agree with that. It's too early in the season to sort of tell much. I think, you, you know, I don't think there's anything to be concerned about in terms of how Catalan have managed to sort of, you know, grind out a couple of wins. And um, I think it's all for the road performance at the start of the season and you know, things like this. So it's, as I say, it's all just sort of um, start of the season. You expect a couple of results that you didn't expect. And I, I wouldn't have any concerns about those sort of mid table teams yet. No, definitely. They they need to start separating themselves from those bottom four, and maybe maybe we could go back to the qualifiers because if those bottom four don't win a game all year, maybe the top four of the championship w would like that. I don't I mean I didn't mind the qualifiers as such. I didn't like the super eights, but I didn't mind the qualifiers. Um, I don't know if you two would would be happy with the qualifiers coming back. Yeah, anything but the super eight. <laughs> Toby, what did what go on quickly? So, so, would you like to see the qualifiers come back between like maybe the bottom three or the or maybe like a little playoff between the bottom two Super League and the top two of of the championship? Uh, I, I wouldn't be against it, but what I hate about it is the fact that it would mean that we'd have to watch league fixtures between the top eight. So, you know, like if no, you run it at the same time as the playoffs. You just do eleven eleven versus well eleventh versus second, and then twelve versus first. It's too. I think it's too much of a that, that financial risk aspect that the million pound game brought in, isn't it? Um, but in terms of like an ideal sporting competition, I don't see why. Like that is what you want to see. That's edge of your seat stuff. That's really exciting. Until a team accidentally get themselves into the Super League, who don't have gr a grass pitch to play on or something. But mm. yeah, yeah, we're, we're looking at you, Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. It's uh, yeah, no, that, I think that would be exciting, and the ult that would be like the ultimate goal, you know. It's it'd be like to be able to have you know teams earn their place in Super League like that. But mm. I think you know, and I think everyone sort of spoke out about how you know how negative it, it how negative it is in terms of the way of clubs run as a business to be able to do that. Yeah, we've seen what it's done to London having that that year in Super League where they probably weren't ready to go up. They they phenomenally they played phenomenally well in the year that they were there. Obviously, getting relegated, and then since then it's it's got worse and worse for them. And that's a, that is obviously at this point, especially for the, us us fans that are, are down south and enjoyed seeing London. Before we move on to the Hall of Fame and, and the NRL watch and everything else, Saints have won the last three Super League titles. Are Warrington or are Wigan their nearest rivals? Well, you would say, based on the first three rounds, that they are the nearest rivals, but it doesn't mean they're close. <laughs> I think the Saints are going to run away with it. And I know it's boring to say, and we'll probably be saying it all year, but I actually generally do think that they're a, a, a great side. Toby, do you think Saints will run away with it, or do you think Wigan and Warrington could hold on and really pressure them? Or even Huddersfield, like two wins out of three for them this year. Yeah, everything we know about Warrington, you know, I can't <laughs> see them going neck and neck with Saints. However... I really do like what Wigan are doing. Um, Wigan have been fantastic and they're playing the Wigan way. Uh, with a, well, They've got X-Factor players. Jai, Fry, Jai Field stays fit and all of a sudden mm. that team's good to go all year. Um, yeah, so I think there's a genuine you know, um, sense for me that Wigan could set Saints, especially if Saints maybe go. No, we don't need another a dinner plate. <laughs> <laughs> just go for the. Just go. Yeah, they might not want to finish first. They might be like, you know what? We'll finish second. We'll rest a few players. Like if we're if we're a couple of points off, the league leader's shield is not is not the be all and end all for Saints. They want that fourth title. You know they do. You know Christian Wolf wants wants to bring that wants to bring wants to win three in a row for him. Is it three in a row for him if he wins, or is it did did, did um. Did, did, was it, is it two no. and two? 
I don't know. I think it would be three for him. Yeah, so three for him. It'd be three for Christian Wolf, the head coach of Tonga. He's brought Sirinan in. He's been unreal. Ignatius Parsi's come in. He's been unreal. Will Wapawate's placed Conrad, replaced Conrad Harrell. Lewis Dodd slid into that number seven shirt with ease, or the number six shirt with ease. Jack Wellsby is proving to be England's number one fullback or centre or winger or standoff wherever he decides to play or even loose forward I think he played a little bit in the Challenge Cup final last year and like you said Robin it's, it might be a little bit boring but it, it's fun isn't it it's fun to it's fun to see you, you know you don't get to see these great sides that you you just sit back and you know you're watching like history makers so you can enjoy it from that point of view I think you, you mentioned Huddersfield I, I don't think that they're a serious threat but I, I quite like that team they seem they seem um, they've got like a, a young spine, and I, I hope that they sort of like have fun this season. I hope that they don't look at this and go, "All right, now we need to knuckle down and grind out a, a top top table finish." I, I want them to enjoy it because I think that's when they play the best. So I don't want to give them any expectation because I think they play better when they're just a free flowing team that's enjoying their their games, win or lose. Yeah, hundred percent. We do need to move on. I've looked at the time. We've been we've probably chatted about England a little bit too long at the start. But we need to move on. Saints, Saints are well and truly becoming a Hall of Fame side, aren't they, Robin? And and it, it, that's a really good segue into your Hall of Fame selection for episode seven. That was good. You prepared that. <laughs> I didn't. So, I, I thought of it in thirty seconds. I was like, bang. That was incredible. <laughs> so my my um, Hall of Fame entry is a, is actually a player this week. <laughs> than a, whatever it was. Last time. I think it was quarter flags um, or something. Yeah, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, this guy is a legend. He's, he's still he's still playing, um, and he's an absolute stat machine. Um, and it's the the great Jason Tamalolo, the Tongan prop. So, um, his his career, um, just to give you an idea, because I mean the stats speak for themselves. But basically, he, he played um, ten games for the Kiwis between 2014 2017. He won a, an NRL Grand Final in 2015. He was the Dalian Player of the Year in 2016. Um, some of the stats, basically his stats, his running meter stats, <laughs> for those that don't know, he's a, he's a massive top forward. He's literally unstoppable, but he's also got skill. He's got fitness. He plays 80 minutes. Um, so he, in, in 2016, he, he ran the most meters per game over the course of a, a season, a staggering four and a half uh Thousand miles, uh, thousand meters. Sorry, he's a four and a half <laughs> thousand me- miles. <laughs> sorry, meters. Thousand um, which works out one hundred sixty-five per match miles per match. Um, <laughs> average of twenty-five tackles a match. Um, he's got the longest NRL contract deal, ten ten years of 27, uh, 2027, um, believed to be worth ten million per year. <laughs> Um, and it was nicely timed. I'm sure his agent had him doing it. He was um, scouting with the NFL to, to join American football just before the deal. So I'm sure that added an extra few bucks to his deal. Uh, in 2017, grand, run, grand final runners-up. Um, and he also led the NRL with um, 5,000 miles plus <laughs> the year, most ever done by a forward in the NRL, which equates a lung-busting. 200 meters plus per game, and it, he's still is he's still doing these crazy records. Any time he plays a match, you look at the stats, and he's just absolutely killing it. He's he's set such a good pl- uh, platform for his team, the, the North Queensland Cowboys. Um, he was part of that um, grand final winning team. Uh, another legend called JT um, joined him in that game that Toby um, added to the Hall of Fame as well. But the the. Ri- so this is a good enough reason to put him to the Hall of Fame, obviously. But the reason why I've fallen in love with this player is what what he did for international rugby league. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, he played for the Kiwis, and previously, um, any any player, any Pacific Island nation player who was good enough would would if they had if they had the correct um, heritage, they would play for Australia or they would play for. Um, New Zealand because they were the two big teams. They got the, they got more matches, bigger coverage, um, probably more pay as well. So the achievement was to get to those teams. But in 2017, um, Tamalola he 
kick-started a Pacific Revolution, <laughs> and he switched his allegiance um, to Tonga in time for the World Cup, and he encouraged or it promoted others to join him, such as David Fafita and Tui Lola here, which we, we all know is um, in the Super League, he's uh, the halfback. And these defections um, like lifted this team and helped Tonga beat the Kiwis in the group stage of the World Cup, and they pushed England all the way in a tenth, and it was an amazing uh, semi-final in Auckland. Just literally, the crowd was completely red. There was Tonga flags everywhere, and it was just like a whole movement off the back of this guy. And and let's be honest, um, I, I I'm English, Brad. You're English, um, and. I, I would say that the call on the day went the wrong way. I think that Fafita was stripped, regained possession, scored in the final play of the game, and I think that Tonga should have played in that World Cup final, but they didn't. But that's not the point. They 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 completely changed this this international uh, this this nation that was sort of resigned itself as a little brother to Australia and New Zealand, um, and since they've beat them, they've beaten both of them. Yeah, they have. Obviously, they beat. They beat the Qs, but they also beat Australia, which, let's not forget, beating the Giants of Australia is a feat that, that the British, that we've not achieved since 2006, <laughs> despite all of our resources, we have the whole, the biggest competition in the Northern Hemisphere. It's been a goal of ours for a, as long as I can remember, and <laughs> we can't do it yet. This tiny little Pacific Island nation, off the back of, of Tamalolo and, and his sort of leading the charge, uh, in, a, in a short period of time, they, they are the top team, and like, let's be fair, that was 2017 that he sort of led this yeah. change, and they're still they're still such a strong team. Like the top players from Tonga want to play for Tonga. It's about more than just who's the best national side um, that I can play for, and they're still good. Like who 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 dares write them off for, for the World Cup this year? Let's be fair, like they're, they're yeah. quality. The way the Australians are playing and the way that the New Zealand is, the squad's looking exactly. at them, isn't it? Tonga, Tonga probably going to this as, as favourites, especially if the lads that can play for both Tonga and Australia or Tonga and New Zealand decide to play for Tonga. Like, Tamalolo yeah. has led this country. For, the Fafita brothers have led this country. You've got Fusatua went from New Zealand to Tonga. Some of these lads, that Daniel Tupo went from like one of Australia's best wingers to being the Tongan winger. Like, these players fully deserve to, to be where they are and to be one of the top teams in the world. I just think they need some better halfbacks. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> of course, yeah, they do. And, you know, they are, like, they are a small country. But I feel like in, in sport, you can be the best team. But if, if a team's got, like, an edge, if they've got a heart, if they've got a higher purpose, mm. then that that multiplies their talents so much more than you can you can quantify. So... That's why I've added him. I, I I just love what he's done for international rugby league. Um, we're we're all so so blessed to have watched his career, but also to to have this fourth great nation in the World Cup that really really is like you know, they're going to beat us if we play against them with the <laughs> squad that Sean Wayne's lifted. They're going to beat us. So I, I I absolutely this guy's got to go in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, a hundred percent. I definitely agree with you there, and it's quite apt because. He's halfway through his contract this season. He's halfway through that yeah. £10 million, 10-year contract for a million pound a year. And he plays for the North Queensland Cowboys. And they finished 13th in the NRL last season. And they didn't particularly use him very well. And you hope that they can use him well again this year. But it, it's perfect. Jason Tamalolo belongs in the, in the Hall of Fame. And he belongs in our Biff Hall of Fame. He's the second JT to go in the Hall of Fame. In seven weeks, maybe we can just have a have a record of as many as many JTs as possible in our Hall of Fame. But it links perfectly to the not watch NRL NRL watch. And Toby's, I think you've got a little game for us this week, haven't you? Yeah, so we're rolling it back to like nineteen eighties television, and we're going to play some higher or lower. Bruce, um, Bruce is is the Price Is Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to be playing it with the NRL club, so we're going to do half this week and then half next week. Um, we're going to start with the bottom half of the table um, as the NRL starts March 10th um, on a lovely Thursday morning. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to go up the table from 16th to 9th, going to quickly look at sort of what's changed for each club. And then I'll get you two to say whether they're going higher or lower in the table. 
Um, so I guess for the bottom, we're doing higher, higher or same. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, unless they're going to be so bad that they finish below the Redquist Dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus, they might, they might just sink. The Dolphins will definitely <laughs> swim, but these guys might sink. So we start off with obviously the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs, uh, a team we've looked at a little bit over a few weeks. They've brought in Matt Burton, Josh Adokar, Brent Naden, Matt Dusty, Paul Vaughan, Tavita Pengai Jr., who I saw an article about um, recently, um, as well as Josh Cook, Max King, Braden Byrne, Reid Hoffman, losing Nick Kotrick, Nick Meany, Renu Fatoni, Will Hofwati, Adam Elliott, Lachlan Lewis, Dylan Narpa. Um, obviously, it's clear that He's, uh, you're really concerned with you, Brad. <laughs> they're, going, they're being higher, higher, 100% higher. Like, they can't not finish the same. If this team finishes bottom of the NRL, then the West Tigers have shocked the world. <laughs> like, geez, like, like, I don't know. They, then then they're, there's something gone drastically wrong if these, if this team finishes bottom. Like, genuinely. I, I, you have to... You, Robin, you've got to agree with me, haven't you? Yeah, to- totally. You know, they, what, did they only win three games? Like, <laughs> three or four games last year? Yeah, so they of course they've got to do better than they did last year, and they're an exciting side as well. Like I like I like the um, the signings that they've made. They've probably had the most exciting off season. We have spoke about them already, so yeah, I think they'll definitely finish higher. Absolute consensus there. They then go to fifteenth, and Jason Tamalolo's uh, mighty North Queensland Cowboys. Um, they have brought in well, they brought in Town- Chad Townsend halfway through last season, I believe. Chad Townsend went somewhere else, didn't he? He went to the New Zealand Warriors and now he's coming yeah. to North Queensland. That's great. So they brought in Chad Townsend, Peter Hiku, Jermaine Tanua Brown, and Brendan Elliott, and lost uh, lost Michael Morgan to retirement, Francis Molo, Corey Jensen, Justin O'Neill, Shane Wright, Peter Holler, and Javid Bowen. Um, in 2023, they'll be getting Luciano Leilua as well, but that's not important for this <laughs> year. So do we think they'll go higher or lower? They don't. They're not. They don't stand out to me generally. I think they're cannon fodder. They didn't. Protect, they didn't play particularly well last year. They didn't use Jason Tamalolo to his full ability. But if he's their only star player, he's going to have to carry the twenty-four other members of that twenty-five man squad and whoever else is in the extended squad. He's not good enough. Yeah, yes, he's in our Hall of Fame and we know he's a quality player. But he's not good enough to lead that that sort of quality team to to a playoff spot. Um, I think they're just lucky that JT's got five more years left on it, on that deal that Robin spoke about. I think they finished bottom of the table. Yeah, and the other thing with JT is like the last few years he has he's been off the field a lot with injuries. So like you 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 require him to have a full season to even stand a chance of getting himself off the bottom. And I think the sign is that they've made whilst they're slight improvements. In the NRL, if you're making slight improvements, you're moving backwards compared to everyone else. So mm. for me, I I think that um, they could be up for a wooden spoon. So I would say they're gonna they're gonna finish lower. So we already know who's finishing bottom of our league table, then, don't we? When, next, when we come to do the predictions next week. The whole point of higher and lower was to not make a league table. <laughs> Yeah, they finish 15th and we think they're worse off this year than they were last year. Like, we haven't really got a choice with these guys, to be fair. So, yeah, we move on to the Brisbane Broncos, who finished 14th last year. Shot. We've talked about these quite a bit. Um, Adam Reynolds, Kurt Capel, Branko Lee coming in uh, just as the main names. Billy Walters as well, probably. Is a big name I better mention, Brad Wright. Um, I love Billy Walters. Then, uh, uh, and then Xavier Coates, uh, Brody Croft, Anthony Milford, Alex Glenn, uh, John Atty Arter are the main names leaving. Uh, do the Canterbury Bulldogs finish well high? I don't know what it is about the Brisbane Broncos. I don't know if it's the team because the team's not bad. The team is not awful. It's just something in the culture of that club makes them a bad team. I think it's the youth products. I honestly think that their youth products aren't coming through at the rate, you know, that they they want that like Wigan style of mm. victory where it's all youth players coming through. I want Robin. To... Yeah, I want Robin to go first on this one. <laughs> yeah, it's um, difficult to call in it. I kind of I kind of thought they are, they sort of completely went off the rails and I thought they would have fixed it quicker than now so part of me thinks like 
actually they've had enough time now. Surely they've got it right. I know like Reynolds is is a big signing for them. You know, South didn't really want to let him go. Um, he's a Premiership halfback, but is he? Can he? Like we were saying with with Tamara, can he carry this team? Like, can he really lift the players around him? He, he does. He does rely on them to set a bit of a platform to do what he does. So um, I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult one to call. If if it wasn't higher or lower, I'd say they're just going to stay the same. But I think based on previous seasons. Um, I have just a general lack of faith because, like you say, the problems run so deep, and so I'll I'll go with lower for them. Yeah, I think I'm going to go lower as well. I think we'll, we'll be. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say. Well, we know where they're going to finish if they're finishing lower because we know they're finishing bottom of the league. They're going to be fifteenth in the NRL table. I think. Uh, yes, I personally would say higher, but that's because I know who I would also put fifteenth, and I would say higher. Um, he's putting West cool. Toby's putting West Tigers 15 um, that is a good segue on to on to West Tigers I just think Adam Reynolds is going to have a good season um, in terms of being able to drag them through this yeah the way. fact that he's been, he's coming and he's been given that captain's armband though yeah, they've got ab- so, yeah as I said they always find out but, um, and we're sort of split on that but next we move on to your West Tigers Brad um, your main signings um, as, as everyone knows the Wigan boys um, Hastings and Gildart, Tyrone Peachy and Stafford Toa join them, as well as a rugby union player. Um, uh, and to, so you've had to sacrifice Jerry Day Lewis for the championship, um, Moses Embai, Billy Walters, Michael Cheekham. Are you missing any of these players? I'm not missing any of them, I'll be honest. Um, the team's better. Um, it's not amazing, it's not the best team that we've had for a while. Ken Marlow is in there, Jackson Hastings is in there, Oliver Gildart's in there. I like Stafford Toa, I like Tyrone Peachy, I like Adam Dewey, I like Luke Brooks, I like that back line. The only problem is, is we have the worst forward pack in the NRL. Don't you agree, Toby? <laughs> we haven't added to it. We haven't added to it at all. A little bit. But yeah, it's... Cracking at the seams, yeah. Yeah, it's a young forward pack. We have loads of players in the extended squad. So I've never seen so many players in the extended squad. Um, we've got three development players, and I think we've got about fifteen. Uh, Junior Powell goes in there, but he's a he's a centre. Tyrone Roberts is in the um, extended squad this year. We haven't really got we haven't got anything up front apart from James Tarmo. Uh, Simpkins probably um, Twal and Seyfarth are, pro- are not very good um, McKaylee's crap Musgrove's crap Luke Garner and Luciano Lelua probably don't belong there um, we need to seriously improve that, that forward pack if we want to finish any heart, any we want to improve we need to improve that forward pack <laughs> if we're finishing in the playoffs again if we finish 8th or ninth. I still finish. I still have a feeling we might finish a little bit higher this season. We look really good in preseason, so hopefully we can do that. If we don't play well, I want Michael Maguire gone by my birthday. I Michael Maguire is a big, big like you know. Either he's a genius bringing across um, Hastings and Gildart, or it's it's a failed project, and then they really are exposed because when we're saying they don't have a forward pack, if, if the two backs that they've brought in aren't playing well either, mm. that's a weak side. So I think a lot hinges on that. And and to be honest, Michael Maguire's time at West probably hinges on it as well. But for me, I, I think Michael Maguire's um, a good coach. I think he's capable of, of lifting this West team. Um, depending how those transfers go, the, the players that he's managed to offload and bring in, it, I think it's a trade-up. Um, and yeah, I think I'm. I think I would. I was gonna go higher for the West Tigers, not by a lot. But Get in. I, I'm feeling much <laughs> more positive about them this year than I was last year. I still think they're a weak side, like you said. But I, I am gonna. I am gonna trade up the West Tigers. Yeah, I think. They'll, I think they'll stay the same. Um, that's not. That's not an option. No, don't that's not an option. Yet. You can't sit on the fence now. It's not an option. <laughs> But I'm just looking at the teams I think are genuinely going to finish below them. And he's flipping a coin. <laughs> he is. He's on, he's on coin flip. If I genuinely think will finish below them, then I've got them dropping down. So I would say lower. 
Uh-huh. You look at you look at one to seven. You got Dane Laurie, Kemamalo, Oliver Gilda, to, um, Tom, uh, Tommy Talau, Stafford Toa, Jackson Hastings, Luke Brooks, Adam uh, well, Adam Dewey in there as well as, as your sort of your versatile player. Jock Madden is is probably really really good. David Norfolk is still in there. Backs wise, I think it's probably one of the it's one of the best backs yeah. divisions you're going to get in the league. If they haven't got a platform to play off, it's going to be a really, really tough season. And we need the likes of Joe Offengawi, Tyrone Peachy and James Tamo to stay injury-free and play well and constantly be on that pitch. And and for James Tamo and, and Offengawi, we probably need them to put in 80-minute performances. As a West fan, we need those players to put in 80-minute performances and good quality 80-minute shifts as well. We can move on before I get carried away. Yeah, we'll move on to the New Zealand Warriors. <laughs> They've only brought in Sean Johnson, Ash Taylor, two half <laughs> Jesse Arthur and Aaron Penney, uh, losing, of course, two of Arthur Sheck to Rugby Union, uh, Chad Townsend, as we just covered, as well as some forwards in Kane Evans, Lisa Malmau, uh, and uh, David Fusa, two of the winger going to Leeds, um, so, uh, among sort of a couple other losses. Uh, definitely lost more than they've gained this season. Yeah, tough one. They're back in New Zealand, though, aren't they? They, they will. They will be back in New Zealand this year, and we know that those home, those fans in New Zealand, are going to cause carnage when they're back at home. They're going to be so loud, and you won't want to be. You won't want to play them away. Anyone that's playing them away is going to be in for a shock of their life. Reese Walsh, Watin Zelezniak, Ash Taylor, Bailey Sirinan, Adam. I love Adam Pompey. Matt Lodge is there. He repl- he's like the the Kane Evans replacement um, for them. Cody Nikarima, Ben Murdoch, Masilla. You look at the team, and I think it's fantastic. I think the loss of Tuivasa Shek doesn't matter because they've got Sean Johnson in there now. I just hope, for their sake, that Ash Taylor shows us that he was worth that million pound a year that the Titans put on him. That, and I think that's what it comes down to: what halfback partnership do they pick this year? Um, but I really hope that they finish higher, and I'm going to go. I'm going to go. They're going to finish in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about Sean Johnson. I don't know about Ash Taylor. I think um, losing to a vice shot, I do think it matters. I think it's really, he, he's such a massive player. He, they won games purely off, off his back last year. So I think they'll really miss him. Um, other than that, like, like there's not a lot of change and they, were, they are a pretty uh, respectable side. So it sort of depends on was were, how much were they affected by not being in New Zealand, how mm. much of a lift are they going to get from that? I think that's the big, the big question. Um, we uh, we spoke about Tonga and playing for a higher purpose and how it lifts sides, but I don't. I personally don't think that you, that lasts a full year. I don't think. I think you can get away with it for a, a finals, for a World Cup, for you know a short period of time. But to to have that for a whole season is is so difficult to keep the momentum up. Um, I don't. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I want. I want to say higher because I, I, I obviously. Mm. They're everyone's. They're everyone's. They're everyone, they're everyone's second yeah. team. If they're not your first team, they're your second team in in, in Australia now, eh? because they have so much love, whether it's from their own fans or other fans, just for the effort that they've put in the last two seasons to not like half of these players haven't seen, didn't see their family in two years, but so in order for the competition to keep running, that is huge, and they deserve to be a playoff team. Josh Curran, by the way. Watch out for him this season. He is going to rip up in that back row. And this is this is the thing. Like they, they're a good side. They have these players, and they've even got like these guys coming through that have have great potential. But then I also think, well, they've they've played in these sort of unfortunate circumstances that have been much tougher than usual. So, so sometimes you can argue that that brings the team together and actually brings mm. the most out of them because they've got they've got a, 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 a shared cause that they're fighting against and the, the world's against them and so they mm. want to prove everyone wrong. Who knows? They might get to New Zealand and be like, oh, like you know, they might yeah. relax almost. Who who knows which way it's going to go? I I think I hate I hate to say it. I hope I really hope I'm proven wrong, but I'm going to have to go lower. For the Warriors this Ooh, year. Big, big shout. Let's move on before I. Makes two sense. It's just that they're historically quite a physical team and they've, they've lost some forward depth going into this year. Mm. Um, it depends on how much magic Sean Johnson and Ashtray are going to produce. I don't think it'll be enough and I would also say lower. Um, 
go to the St. George Dr Illawarra Dragons, who last year finished 11th. Uh, their key losses are Cam McInnes, who barely played last season, I believe. Um, didn't. He was injured, I believe, a lot of the year. Um, Matt Dufty, Gordon Pereira, Adam Clune, Paul Vaughan, Cade Ellis, Aidan Williami, Corey Norman. Significant, significant losses. Bringing in Jaden Sewer, Frank Molo, George Burgess, Moses Embai, Moses Seeley, Aaron Woods, Jack Koshevsky. Some sort of good forwards coming in through the doors, but they haven't really replaced Dufty. No, that and that is probably where they might go a bit wrong. They, they were sat in the playoffs for a lot of time, from round three to like round twenty last season before before something happened. I don't know what happened. Whether it was an injury off the top of my head, I can't see like what happened. This is a scandal. Sh yeah, it was bad. It was the scandal, wasn't it? I think that was the problem. Was that what it was? Did you want to remind me of this scandal? The, um, what was it? The barbecue or something? And that's why Paul Vaughan ended up at the Oh, yeah. They, they had a lot of they had a lot of players that got banned, didn't they, for eight to nine yeah. to the rest of the season. No Corey Norman, no Trent Merrin. They're both retired. Um, K, they've lost Cade Ellis as well. The players that they've lost, I don't mind. That they've lost them, like you said, they they haven't necessarily replaced Matt Dufty. You look through their squad now and go, who's going to play fullback? Moses M by Tyrrell Sloan. By the way, Sloan is rapid. Sloan pre-season tore up. They they need to get the best out of George Burgess. They need to get the best out of Ben Hunt. Zach Lomax, his kicking will be key. If they score tries, they need him to kick the goals. Um, they finished where did they finish last year 11th I'm going to go higher but not playoffs so they're going to finish 9th or 10th I think yeah I um, I don't like this Dragons team whilst I like getting rid of Corey Norman absolutely fine with um, I just there's players in there's players in there that we've not seen anything amazing from. Some like Ben Hunt. Um, I just, I don't know. I just don't like this Dragon side. It's just everything that happened last year, I think, um, worries me from a, you know an internal culture point of view. Mm. Um, I yeah, I I just can't I just can't see them improving on eleventh. To be honest, I think whilst they did. They did. They were in the the playoffs for a lot of last year. I think they still actually overperformed last year, um, but I, I I think they'll continue the downward trajectory that they saw towards the end of the season. So I'm going to give them lower this year. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I'd go lower too. I just think that they're bomb. Like it's going to be another season of saying where's Ben Hunt's best position. Uh, you know, who should start in this position, that position. Who's mm -hmm. their, what's their best options? I think that they. I just don't think the team picks itself. I think it's going to be a sort of a long journey um, to sort of find themselves. And you know, I know they're sort of locked into contracts at the moment, um, so we'll sort of see. But I, I would, I actually would say lower as well. Um, move on to my beloved Canberra Raiders. Uh, the their major news is that Jamal Fogarty is going to be playing in the uh, in the number seven jersey. Um, which I think is an absolutely incredible signing. I think, you know, you look around and which halfbacks are available, we need a halfback. And they went and got probably one of the best options um, they could have. Um, other gains for Canberra include um, Peter Hola, Adam Elliott and Nick Kotrick coming back. Um, and, but, you know, they've had to lose Ryan James. Uh, Saliba Havili, who was fantastic. He was really good. Fantastic player. Uh, Bailey Simonson. Uh, C.S. Eliola retires. Dynamis Louis gets released. To Redcliffe. Yeah. Bad, bad um, move. Scott gets released, I think, for obvious reason. And Caleb Aiken <laughs> gets allowed to go to Lee. So. Yeah. Um, oh, this, is gonna, this is probably going to break your heart, Toby, but you probably expect it. Uh, they're going to finish lower this season. They're not. They're, I'm looking at this team now. You've got four players that arguably will, will could start at fullback for you, and you need to fix it big time. You've got 
like two centers, out and out centers, and that's Semi Valame. Well, not even Semi Valame. Matthew Tomoka and uh, Jared Croker. You, you, Josh Papali, Elliot Whitehead, Ryan Sutton. They, there's there's a lot of work for these lads to do. The squad is not bad. But it's been it. You've brought in Adam Elliott and Nick Kotrick from a Canterbury Bulldog side that finished bottom of the table, and they didn't stand out very well last season. I think Jamal Fogarty is your shining light in terms of ins. Dynamis Louis shouldn't have been allowed to leave. Um, Curtis Scott obviously huge loss. Back, great player, you, understandably f- fine to be released, and it's sad to see Sia Soliola retire because he the, the amount of effort that he puts in. I think it's a really young team where it matters, and I don't think I, I don't see them finish higher than tenth at all this season. Yeah, I, like like you say, Fogarty is the only thing that puts a question of doubt in my mind. But saying that, um, that Titans team that he was in last year was they were predicting great things, and they scraped in in the last round in three eight. So his his influence is. It can't be that great. Otherwise, no. he would have done it with that Titan side. Yeah. So I don't think he's enough to um, cover the difference and um, make up for the Raider side. To be honest, I, I would put them 10th, but if I've got to go higher or lower, um, I think it's lower for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of Ricky Stewart. I think he's a good coach, but I don't think he picks, I don't think he picks the right team on a weekly basis. Um, to, but, I, but I do think tactically he can be quite sound. Um, you know, it's not a complete sort of hate on him. Um, it's it's going to be weird. It looks looking like Xavier Savage is going to start at fullback. Um, which then, if you start con- conceding tries, you're going, why isn't Nickel Klopstad back there mm-hmm. defending? Um, yeah. You know, Rappiner is probably going to end up in the centres at some point. I do. I, there's a lot to like. Um, I will. You mentioned that you know, one of our out centres is Matt Tomoko. I actually, if you go on his Wikipedia page, uh, the the little bit about his debut, I actually wrote um, way back when he debuted. So I was like, <laughs> I him when he first. <laughs> so that that Timoko made his NRL debut in round sixteen of the twenty twenty NRL season for 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 the Canberra against the Canterbury oh, Bank Canberra. Temple. <laughs> he replaced an, an injured Curtis Scott in the forty seventh minute as the Canberra club won the game thirty four twenty. Good man, really good England. <laughs> you know what? It's been there for like two years. And I, I can't. I can't moan. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna complain. I've, we've we've all written stuff on on um, Wikipedia. It's good fun. But yeah. So I mean, I as I like this camera, and I know what Ricky. Well, like, I know what Ricky Stewart's capable of. But I also know sort of where this camera team is capable of getting to. I will cross my fingers for a higher. Um, but you know, I do really appreciate what you two are saying <laughs> in terms of they have just got worse. Uh, and Josh Hodgson is probably going to frustrate the hell out of I don't them. think they've got worse. I just don't think they've got much better. And I'd, like you said, Ricky Stewart is not the guy to lead this team. Yeah. That's that's how I see it anyway. So the last team of the bottom of the bottom eight uh, for this week is the Cronulla Sutherland Sharks. Uh, an interesting team, the Sharks, really, aren't they? I mean, I remember, I think the first grand final I properly sat down and watched was the one that I had him watch from the start to the end uh, was the one that they won. But they have gained Cam McGuinness, uh, Nico Hines, Dale Finucane, these are some big names. Big names. Uh, Matty Cavalu, um, and they've lost Sean Johnson, Aaron Woods, Josh Dugan, Billy Magulius. So I think they've definitely and improved. Chad, Chad, and Chad Townsend, for some a rude reason. That... <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, I would say they've definitely improved, though. Hundred percent, and they were really good last year. They don't, they just, they just missed out, it's like by the slimmest of margins, missed out on the um, on the playoffs last year. Arguably deserved to be a playoff side last year. Um, the loss of Andrew Fafita um, in that like final third of the season after his injury was huge for them. They've still got Wade Graham, Hamlin, ULA, a little bit inconsistent. Same with Royce Hunt, but when they're on, if they can be more consistent, they'll be phenomenal. Ikavalu is a player that I. I love, I love Matt Ikevalu. Um I think he scored like six tries in an NRL game once or something stupid. Like, he's got, he's scored unbelievable amounts of tries for the Roosters. Really surprised that they let him go. He must have been on a big, a decent contract that they couldn't really afford to keep him on. Cam McInnes 
arguably one of the hardest defenders in in the game. <laughs> huge, huge. Um, and I love Braden Trindle as well. I think Braden Trindle is with him alongside p- p- most likely. Be Nico Hines, yeah, they're they're really short in the half backs. They didn't really do a lot to replace. Um, yeah, they might they probably need a, a a nice half back in there just to give them a little bit of competition, maybe. But it's a really good team, and, and I'm gonna go higher straight away. They're gonna they have to be a playoff team. Yeah, it's it's it, it's like if you're looking at it just as uh, the team higher or lower. You, you'd, I would definitely go higher. I think they've made massive improvements. The three players that they've lost, I think they're just clearing space in the cap. I'm more than happy to see them go. Um, I like this side. I think they're good. But the but the only thing that um, makes me question it more than any other team we've got is that we're asking, is this team going to make the playoffs? <laughs> so it just makes me consider it a bit like, are they actually are they going to get in the top eight or, or stay in ninth? But... Um, no, I, I, I do. I like the start side. I think that they've, um, re- they've recruited really, really well, like we said. And so I'm going to go higher. Nice. I think they've got some questionable depth. I think they're going to be a hard hitting pack, but they've got some questionable depth. And they've got a lot of players who I just I feel are injury prone. Um, you know, they're not going to, they're just not going to be able to get a consistent 17, I don't think. Um, which is interesting, but at the same time, I mean, Nico Hines and the six. Um, is going to be is going to be really interesting to see this season, I think. Um, and yeah, I, would, I think I agree with what you two are saying and say higher too. And yeah. That concludes higher or lower <laughs> for the first part of the for the NRL watch. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to next week because we've got all the playoff sides and fans are not going to be happy if we predict someone in the top eight to finish lower, especially if they've improved. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I know we said we usually do a badge rating, but because it's a double badge rating this week, I'm going to skip over it. Um, because it's coming up to nearly an hour and a half in so we'll crack straight on with, with our set of six predictions if you boys don't mind and we'll do the badge rating for the whole KR home well the whole KR sorry old and the whole KR new badge next week we'll do a double one for you next week um, you boys happy to move on? Yeah, if you want yeah, to stand to the you can just give North Wales Crusaders a 10 <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I don't think yeah, we will. No bias. no bias at all there. No, not at all. Um, but we need to move on to to our set of six. We've already mentioned this game. It, it's Wakefield versus Leeds Rhinos. Both teams haven't won yet this season. Actually, before we go into it, we'll run through. Uh, Robin, six out of six on your predictions. You've caught up with us. You're on twenty five points. Toby, you've dropped down to second, you're on 26 points, and I'm on top of the table on 27 points, so I'm well buzzing for that. Um, but yeah, Wakefield Trinity uh, against Leeds Rhinos, both teams pointless after three rounds. Who picks up the first two points of the season, or does this one go to Golden Point and they both get a point? No, I I think this Leeds team is too good. So, um, yes, they've been inconsistent, but um, if I mean, if they lose this game, there's you know that's a that's a really big question that you've got to start asking. So yeah, I'm gonna pick Leeds. Uh, Toby, are you gonna back? Are you gonna go with Robin? He's on fire. He's on form. He's back in the. Yeah, well, Wakefield are the only team that Leeds managed to beat at the, at the start of last season, and I'd say they do it again. Part of this, I think, this isn't a smart smart decision. So I think Wakefield have actually had some pretty close games, mm. um, surprisingly close games, but we really do want Wakefield out of this league this season. <laughs> Out of all the options, <laughs> not in a horrible way. Out of all the options, to go down, I want it to be Wakefield. So, <laughs> Jesus, that sounds awful. And because of, because you said that, and I'm really sorry for all you Wakefield Wakefield fans that are listening. Um, the way Wakefield played against Catalan, and the way they have played, and the, the closeness of their defeats. I think I'm going to go for Wakefield on this one. They seem to be playing more as a team. They seem to be knowing what sort of rugby they want to play. Mason Lino played for the reserves last weekend, so I believe he's fit and ready to come back in. I think I'm going to go for a Wakefield win here. I think Leeds are going to struggle. And for for someone who doesn't particularly like Leeds, I'm loving this. <laughs> I'm absolutely loving the fact that they've not won a game yet. And I hope they keep keep hold of Richard Agar forever. <laughs> uh, game number two then we so two, you both of you gone for Leeds I've gone for Wakefield on that one game number two oh, oh there we go game number two 
Warrington Wolves at home against Catalan Dragons. Warrington three wins out of three. Catalan two wins out of three. It's a, it's a clash where Warrington kind of need to win it to show that they've they've got the credentials and they've got the potential to be a team to be reckoned with. But it's not a win won't be enough to tell everyone it's their year, will it? Not not just yet. No, I think um, I, I don't know what's going on with the Catalans, but why are exceeding expectations? Um, so, and they're at home. So for me, I'm going to go for Warrington. I think I think I'm going to have to go the same. Um, I back Leeds to beat Catalan, and I was disappointed, and went <laughs> went Catalan won because I needed the point. But <sighs> something about the Catalan forward pack not being amazing is it, sort of. It's umming and ahhing with me, but Warrington just looks so good. Like those, their the halfbacks that they've got look on form, and, and for that reason, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna back Wire as well for this one. Is it gonna yeah, be three I, from three, or are you going for a, an away win? No, it is gonna be a hat trick. I'm just George Williams' biggest fan. I wouldn't say he's anything specifically special of course this you season. Are. But I love, <laughs> just I just love, you know, if Warrington are playing well. I'll always back George Williams to able to get them over the line against Catalan. So for anyone out there who doesn't know who George Williams is, he played for Canberra Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> he played well for Canberra Raiders. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, carry on, carry on. <laughs> no, that's it. I just... That's it. I think of what he's played for Canberra Raiders, full stop. <laughs> I think of what playing well, and I think of what George Williams is capable of, and I think that it'll... I think it's capable of beating Catalan this weekend. But yeah, I mean, based on that, I should be a huge Leeds fan, shouldn't I? Because they've got Caesar and Austin. Yeah, they have. They've got yeah, they've got the two they've got the two halfbacks that lead you to the top of the NRL table, and you're going. I love George Williams, <laughs> <laughs> who was there for what a year, eight maybe yeah. six maybe six months. Like, come on, sort it out. <laughs> uh, game number three. It's a game that you two might not um, know where you're going on this one. But um, Oxford University Rugby League welcome Cambridge University Rugby League for the varsity game uh, on Saturday, which I'll be heading down to with, with uh, Stuart and Rob. Uh, Rob Ashton, one of the Bedford Tigers lads, he is the head coach of the Cambridge Uni team. And for the first time in, I believe, 15 seasons or something crazy, something very, very drastic, Cambridge won the varsity game last year. Will they repeat or will it be revenge and re regain for, for Oxford University? Either of, either of you done any research and want to go first? I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I'll go first because it'll make no difference. Where, who did you go for? I missed it. Um, well, I went for Oxford. Um, I don't. I don't care who wins. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I I spoke at, um, when we were talking about the Army Rugby League and the Navy Rugby League about how uh, Rugby League was banned in these. Um, institutions back in the day and so um, I, I like the fact that there's probably some uh, posh stuck up rugby union expletive <laughs> who hates the fact that there's a rugby league match on this weekend between the two universities so <laughs> I, I hope for that for those people out there that this just makes them cringe and feel really uncomfortable inside I would um, just like to point out Will, Will Greenwood uh, England World Cup winner has played for Cambridge University Rugby League in the last 12 wow. months so yeah but they, these guys there's, there'll be some big names like you look at the rugby union players that go to these universities and there's some big rugby league names that go to the universities it's just whether or not they get to play at that level um, so I'm going to let Toby pick his first before you two probably know where I'm going yeah, well, when there's a sports event between Oxford and Cambridge all you can really do is look at the results of last year's boat race and go <laughs> <laughs> Cambridge won the boat race in 2021, so I'll take Cambridge to win yeah. the boat. Uh, and I'm I'm going with Cambridge as well. I've got I've got to back the the winners from last year. They are improving every year. I think they've won majority of their games this season. So even their their second team look look particularly strong. So good luck to Cambridge. I can't wait to get down there on on um on Saturday. It'll be a good one. It'll be really really good to go to go and watch that game. And I'm going to go back. I'm going to back the the light blues on this one. National Conference League kicks off this weekend as well. We've got we've got two community sides that did particularly well in the Challenge Cup facing off this weekend in the in the opening round. It it's Rochdale Mayfield versus your York Acorn, Robin, and I'm gonna let you go first again. Yeah, and what a malforing fixture. And these these two teams have already like got the season off to a fantastic start. 
Um, obviously, you know my my ties to your K Corp. <laughs> I hope they win, but I'm gonna have to go with Rochdale just because Ooh. they they y y yeah I am because they did they did well in the cup as well um, and they did lose to Doncaster but not by much and that is a League One side so I think they'll take a lot from that and so I'm gonna go against what my heart wants and back Rochdale. Uh, Toby, um, I think I've, I'm going to go watch Dell as well. I think they've been they've been phenomenal. They've been really really good. They probably deserve to go that little step further in the cup. They arguably have played a lot better than the Navy did, um, and potentially arguably better than the Huns. They both beat, I believe they both beat League One sides in in the cup. So York, they struggled. They struggled when it came to playing the League One sides, and Rochdale didn't. And I think that's where the, where this game lies. But They've had they've had a big preseason. They've prepared, and they they both both teams have spent nearly a month now preparing for this fixture. Do you see it? Do you see it being a close run affair, or do you see one team running away with it? Uh, uh, look, yeah, you two are making the sensible arguments in terms of <laughs> where it's going to go. But if it wasn't for York and their beautiful golden acorns, we wouldn't have a bad rate in segment. That is, <laughs> that is true. Uh, so, as they've been my friends since the start, I will. Uh, well, the Badgers be my friends since the start. I will take your cake on here. And when I'm bottom of the predictions table next week, I'll start predicting series. So <laughs> I'll take your cake on. Nice. That's what we like to hear. We like a little bit of change. We've only had one um, clean sweep of predictions so far. Are we going to get a clean sweep of predictions for this one though? Halifax and Featherstone played off this weekend. Fax went 16 nil down, looked like they were going to bring it back, and then Fev ran away with it again, and they they come out 29-16 uh, winners, I, th I believe, it was the final score, at the Shea. They play at the Millennium Stadium this weekend, Fev versus Halifax. It's, it's a repeat of last year's playoff final, it's a repeat of the, the last weekend's, or the weekend just gone's cup match. I need Fax to pick up a win. Um... But the league's going to be really important to Fev. Mm. Yeah, you're not playing this game of making me pick facts for no good reason other than I want you to be happy. Uh, so give me Fev. Again this season, I'm putting my foot down. Go on. Uh, yeah, I um. I can't look past Fed this year, so I'm going to have to back Fed as well. I'll be honest, neither can I. They're going to be the hump of the league. They're not going to lose a game all season, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the shebang. Um, facts haven't quite hit their stride. Um, I was kind of hoping we'd get a cup run, and as soon as we got Fev, I went, let's hope that Fev don't put out a full-strength team. Let's hope that Fev are more worried about the league. But I would have liked an 1895 game, to be fair, but we're not going to get one of them either. But... Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll. Um, I'm going Fev. We're not going to win this game, and we're away as well. And we hate the Millennium Stadium. It's a the pitch is awful, absolute shoddy pitch, and it'll be dark by four o'clock there with no floodlights. So, perfectly fine. Really superly quality standard. Uh, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> <Yeah, Wayfield. laughs> we're definitely not. You can tell we're not flat cappers, can't you? We're like, we don't want Wakefield in Super League. We don't want Brentford in Super League. But let's be honest, one of those two teams is going to be in Super League next year. Oh, I mean, the way Lee played last night against Witness. Barrow. Oh, yeah. Barrow. Barrow yeah, Barrow. the way Barrow are playing. Barrow. They've got Witness at home. They've got Witness away this week. Um, neither team, apart from Witness in, in, I believe, the Cup last night, neither team, they're both unbeaten in the league, I believe, from what I've seen. Like... Ph yeah. Phenomenal! It, one of these teams O's got to go. We think we should. We predicted Barrow to be down the bottom of the league. We predicted Witness to be roughly where they are in the league right now. Do we see either of these teams smacking the other one around, or do we see do we see Witness pulling rank and going? You know what? You're not a championship side yet. Have that. It's such a difficult call because I would have been all behind witness if this didn't if there wasn't challenge cup week which has just been and um, now i'm going for witness bad or at least just genuinely that cut above mm. with featherstone are they that cut above the rest of the league um i just want to point out you said you said you're picking barrow until they lose every week <laughs> if i have to honor that 
then so be it. You did say, I'm not saying you have to honour it, but you said it at the start. You said, I'm going to pick Barrow until they lose. Yeah, so I've, it's not only Barrow, it's Batley I think I've got this agreement with. Oh, was it Batley? It's one of them. It was one of them. Um, so I, I can't remember. It wouldn't surprise me if I made it with Barrow. Well. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, based on the big score that Winners put up a couple of weeks ago, I think that, yeah, they just got outplayed by Lee. So I'm going to say Widness, and I think that they can still have a good, good league campaign. Uh, I'll let you go next, Robin. Oh, thanks. <laughs> he has um, a to know. He doesn't know, see? Uh, yeah, he's, he, like Toby's saying, it's really hard based on last night's game. That's just put so much questions in my mind over Widness. Um, I, I like this Barrow side, and, um, you know, it's, e it's easy for me to get caught up in, in the excitement. But then... Looking at Widnes, um, they've beat they've beat Halifax and, and they're a, a strong contender. They've beat London, who, uh, you know, mid mid table team. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think maybe this uh, Challenge Cup game. <coughs> sorry, I think this Challenge Cup game might um, shock them, might give them a bit of a wake up call, and highlight some of the the errors in their ways. And so they'll come back stronger from it this week. And therefore, I'm going to pick Widness. You're going to go Widness. And and because of that, because you two have both gone Widness, and we spoke about how Barrow at the start of the show are playing phenomenally well, and Widness didn't look great last night. They struggled without their, their key halves, and Simon Finnegan didn't really know what to do without them by the looks of it. Uh, Matty Smith was there, but it's he didn't look like the Matty Smith of... The Super League old and the, and the top level, and for that note, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Barris, Barrow. I'm gonna go with Maludi. I'm gonna go with Ritson. I'm gonna go with um, I totally forgot the bloke's name now. Um, what? the one we were talking about before, Jared Samet. Uh, Jared Samet. That's it. I'm gonna go with those guys, and I'm gonna say that they get another win and they continue their run. They, they've they've been phenomenal all year. It looks like I'm the one going opposite to a lot of other people. We've had two clean sweeps here, and I've picked against quite a few of you so <laughs> i really hope that i remain top but by the way by the way there was a lot of games we could have picked this week there's a lot of big huge games in in every division whether it's the nrlw the super league the championship the national conference league huge huge fixtures around and i'm lucky enough to be going to one of them um so if you get yourself to any of these games let us know let us know what you think your predictions are going to be in the comments below as well it's been a long episode it wasn't meant to be this long but for some reason it's been nearly an hour and 45 minutes in we've done it Sean Wayne released an England squad what can we say yeah Sean Wayne at, we, last night we sat here and we went yeah let's talk about this let's talk about this let's talk about this and we didn't even realise the England squad was going to be announced today uh, the 1st of March um, yeah happy St. Happy St. David's Day Toby go and pancakes. eat let, yeah go and eat some pancakes We'll do. We'll catch up with your badge review next week. Promise. We'll do. We'll do the double up. But we've been the Biff. It's Tuesday night. We'll see you. Well, it's for you lot. It's Thursday night. Enjoy the Super League tonight. Come on, Wakefield. I want to get a point above these lot. Um, enjoy yourselves. Have a good one. But don't forget. Share, like, comment, subscribe. Do the lot, and we'll see you every week from, for well until the end of the World Cup, and then we'll be, and then that's it. Nah, we won't. We'll be back. We'll be back next year. Yeah, we'll see you. Yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you every week till the end of the World Cup. Uh, we've been the Biff. That's been Robin. That that way. That's been Robin. I get it wrong every week. Uh, that's been Toby. If you listen to us on Spotify, thank you very much. You've, we've had listeners from all over the world. But I best say goodbye. See you later. Have a good one. Goodbye, everyone.